Hello everyone. Okay, we hope we're all uh, well and happy. Uh, what we're going to look at today is looking at continuing our work on the Supreme Court. And what I really mean to do is to begin with just going over some of that stuff from last uh, lesson, if that's the right word. Last time uh, I had a little chat to you, just to make sure you're all happy with judicial independence and judicial neutrality, etc., etc. And then I'll set the next bit of work on the Supreme Court and have a look at is it too powerful. And also we'll have a little chat about the relationship between the Supreme Court and the judiciary in general and the other branches of government, the executive and the uh, legislature. So, uh, last time uh, I spoke to you, you had to basically use that PowerPoint to complete the first couple of pages about uh, the Supreme Court and why it's in the legal system, etc., etc., so, as you should have get, gathered, it was created in 2005. Uh, before that date, it was called the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords. And the law lords actually were members of the House of Lords. The Blair government decided to separate them out, uh, which is common in most countries, in order to give the Supreme Court that greater sense of judicial independence. They actually received no more powers than what they had previously. Um, and where the Supreme Court sits in the legal system is exactly the same place where the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords sat as well. So basically the Supreme Court deals, uh, it's the highest court in the land for appeals. So it's not the first place where cases go, they tend to go there for appeal. It takes up cases of constitutional importance. Um, so it tends not to deal with things like, you know, the Bob Murder Joe and all the rest of it. It's dealing with really important issues. Um, some of the uh, important cases, uh, it can take appeals and points of law which can affect the constitution, the relationship between different institutions. Um, a really good example of that is the Miller case 2017, whereby uh, Miller argued that the Prime Minister could not invoke Article 50 in the process for leaving the European Union uh, on her own. It had to be done. Uh, following a vote in Parliament to say we want to leave the EU and government get on with it, basically. Uh, the government were against that decision, uh, but the Supreme Court argued that um, Parliament should um, start off the process and vote on the process and vote to start off uh, Article 50. Um, so that's a really good example of a case which is a major constitutional issue and it's an important case for the courts, the judiciary, uh, standing up for Parliament and making a decision against the executive, against the government. Uh, the Supreme Court as well, <coughs> and again I suspect this might increase over time, <coughs> well, I'll there. Uh, dealing with cases um, involving the powers of the devolved institutions. What I mean by this is um, conflicts between Westminster, London and the devolved institutions, i.e. between the Parliament in Scotland and Wales or Northern Ireland. I suppose as well I could look at conflicts between them as well, so you know, any conflict which might arise between the Scottish Parliament and Welsh Assembly or something of that nature. And a good example here of a case uh, revolving around this um, over healthcare and healthcare provision. And again, this final one, up until recently, uh, is that the Supreme Court had a job of interpreting law passed by the EU. Again, laws passed by the EU of constitutional importance. And you've got a case there, USA versus Nolan, uh, to do with this. And of course, that power is going to alter and change in there. Uh, as we, well, we've now left the EU, uh, that power is going to disappear. Uh, question five was about how do you get onto the Supreme Court. This is really important um, because what the Constitutional Reform Act tried to do was remove uh, political interference essentially and make the Supreme Court appointment system as transparent, i.e. obvious, and as non-political as possible. So what there is, uh, and this isn't just for the Supreme Court, it's for the higher judiciary as well, there's a Judicial Appointments Committee, which is formed of some senior judges, some senior kind of lawyers and solicitors, those sorts of people. And they interview the various candidates who put themselves forward to say we'd like to be on the Supreme Court or whatever. And essentially, um, they decide who it's going to be. Then officially, 
it goes to the Prime Minister and then the Queen who officially says, yeah, okay then. But they're very much of a ceremonial role, both of those positions. It's really the Judicial Empowerment Committee which kind of decides who is or isn't suitable to be on the higher echelons of the judiciary. Um, this differed to what it used to be because before the, the Constitutional Reform Act, the Lord Chancellor was very much involved in appointing the judges. And the Lord Chancellor um, has a bit of a dubious position because the Lord Chancellor uh, was both the highest judge in the, in the land, he was also a member of the Cabinet, i.e. the Executive, and he was in the House of Lords. So there's a real fusion there of all three branches. So the Blair government decided to separate it all out, get rid of the Lord Chancellor's position in this role, and create this more transparent system for appointing judges. Um, this trying to keep politicians out is really important for judicial independence. And it's really important just to know it, how it process works briefly, because next year we'll look at the American Supreme Court, and there the appointment of Supreme Court judges and federal judges is very political. Um, the President and Congress are involved in the appointment procedure for uh, judges, and <clears throat> uh, it gets extremely political, as we'll find out next year. And again, you can see quite a nice question in the exam. Next year, there's a comparative element in next year's exam, comparing the Supreme Court's judicial independence or something of that nature. Okay, so hopefully that was all relatively straightforward. Uh, there's then a, a picture saying meet the judges. There's a picture of the, the Supreme Court. Actually, I should have updated it because Lady Hale is in the middle of days, no longer the president of the Supreme Court. Uh, she actually retired at Christmas, so I should have put the more updated version on. It's now Lord Reed who's got the top job. Uh, but you can see there how they're predominantly men who are on the Supreme Court. And you can see by their ages as well from that work you had to do. Right, two really important principles regarding the judiciary. One is judicial independence and one is judicial neutrality. Okay, judicial independence basically means that judges must be free from political interference. They must feel able and be able to decide cases uh, based on the merits of the law and their judgment and not fear what politicians will say or do as a consequence. Uh, they mustn't fear that politicians will sack them if they make decisions which politicians don't like or dock their pay or I don't know, call their cat nasty names or anything like that. Okay, judges must feel that they can make decisions free from political interference. That is essentially what judicial independence means. And there's various means by which um, that is upheld in the UK. Things like the appointment system, uh, which has minimum role of uh, politicians. Uh, old judges have got to retire at 70 and then when it's 75 from the Supreme Court. Uh, they can't kind of be sacked or dismissed by politicians uh, before that date. Uh, their pay is also protected, so judges uh, know that whatever decisions they make, then their pay is not going to be affected. All these various things are there to ensure political independence. It is really crucial because in many dictatorships, judges don't feel that freedom and therefore they have to do what the state wants them to do, which can therefore lead to an unfair laws and application of the law. So judicial independence is really important for ensuring that the judiciary uh, can interpret the law and apply the law uh, fairly to all those citizens in the, uh, in the country. Judicial neutrality is slightly different. Uh, what this means is that judges have a responsibility not to be involved in politics themselves, not to make political kind of statements or uh, be involved directly in politics. Um, and so a lot of training takes place for judges to make sure that they interpret the law as the law says and not kind of their own personal biases. Um, and very often judges will decide cases which might go against what they personally believe, what they've got to apply, what's in front of them. And on the video um, I want you to watch for your homework called The Highest Court in the Land, you'll see an example there where Lord Phillips says he came to a conclusion um, about a case which actually was against what he personally thought it should be, but he was following the law. Um, so things like judges as well, you know, can't be members of political parties, they can't go around campaigning, you know, they can't say you're a Tory and leave you after 10 years or anything like that. So neutrality is really important. And that's probably the hardest one in some ways, because how do you know someone's being neutral all the time? Okay, and you can get these unconscious bias of people, can you, as well. Um, and so, you know, there's this process whereby 
Um, if a judge is seen by their other judges as being too harsh or too lenient against certain groups, again, there's, they can actually have some kind of review of their own kind of practice, if you like, to see, oh, actually, you know, you seem to be a bit harsh on these particular cases, etc., etc. Okay, hopefully you found a bit from the textbook fine where you had to say how these two things are kind of being threatened. Um, the next thing you have to do is really important is the power of judicial review. What this basically means is that the judiciary have the power, as long as a case comes up on that issue, they can't just do it kind of willy-nilly. Uh, if a case comes up where a citizen believes uh, that a public body, that could be college, it could be the police, it could be government ministers, um, government agencies like um, the driving standards one, for example, or um, Ofqual, who regulate exams, or Oster to regulate um, inspections, any of those sorts of institutions, the judiciary have the power, if there's a case comes before them, to review their actions. So if you believe that college as a public body has broken the law, if broken to the Equalities Act or the Human Rights Act or something like that, um, you can bring a case and the judges can review the actions of the college against what the law is and they can decide in favour against uh, that institution. Um, in terms of power for the Supreme Court, this also includes government actions. So if you believe the executive, the government, have actually gone against a law, you can actually um, bring a case and the, ju the judges can review that case and review the actions of the government. I suppose the Miller case, for example, partly shows this, where obviously Gene Miller believed that the executive had gone beyond their powers by trying to invoke Article 50 uh, before going to Parliament about it. Now, as part of all of this, well, as before, yes, yeah, part of all of this, uh, you've got this thing called ultra vires. This means where a minister is also seen to have gone beyond their powers. Because obviously ministers, uh, government ministers, they obviously, you know, we've already looked at their, their roles they have, but they've also got this kind of slightly vague powers of being able to influence their decisions. So like, you know, uh, being able to over, like the education secretary being able to have the power to oversee what Ofsted do, and sometimes make um, quite short, you know, quite quick decisions, kind of which you need to make there on the spot type of thing. Now, if you think a minister's gone beyond their powers, it's actually called ultra vires, which is the same thing. It's this review of what ministers are doing and the powers which they're using. And the number of um, judicial review cases really increased in the UK. Uh, it was around about 4,000 or so in the year 2000. It's now near to 16,000. So there's been this massive increase of judicial review cases. And there's been a number of kinds of suggestions put forth to why this is the case. Some have argued it's because of the Human Rights Act and that citizens are now more aware of their human rights uh, and they're more aware that, you know, it's more obvious if the government have broken their human rights, if you like, and therefore they'll happily bring a case. You might say it's down to social media, perhaps, and perhaps people are more aware of what their rights are, more aware of what governments are doing, what ministers are doing. It's easy to find out, you know, uh, which minister has been making these decisions, etc., etc., and perhaps find other people who've also kind of fallen at the sharp end of some government decision and to find out what to do about it. Some have said that the public are more educated these days on the law. Um, it's probably in truth a combination of all these things. Um, but judicial review is really increased in the UK. As I said, it's about 16,000 cases a year uh, of judicial review. And then, of course, the most serious ones, the ones of constitutional importance, will go up to the Supreme Court uh, for final uh, decision. So I hope all that kind of made sense from what you had to do last term. And I hope you can also see how uh, the judiciary and their relationship with the other branches is changing as well. So for some of those cases we've looked at and talked about, you can see how the judiciary have really challenged the executive. They've made decisions which the executive, i.e. the government, are not too keen on. The government were not very pleased with the Miller case, for example, which forced them to go to Parliament before they could invoke Article 50. It also upset the press as well, who called the the judges, um, what did they call them? Was it betrayers? I think actually it was they betrayed the people or something, something of that nature. Then there was a bit of a backlash because then Theresa May did not really back up the judiciary. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so you see there's been that challenge there. 
Um, another one I just thought of as well is that in September, October time um, last year, if you remember, Boris Johnson prorogued Parliament. He closed Parliament down, didn't he, for an extended period. Um, and some thought that was he just did that to try and um, get his Brexit thing through. Uh, that went to the Supreme Court, uh, went straight to the Supreme Court, I believe, and the Supreme Court said he'd acted unconstitutionally and the reasons he gave the Queen were actually wrong and therefore Parliament should not be paroled. That really upset Boris Johnson and the government and it really was supported by Parliament. So you can see how the Supreme Court has actually seemed to be siding against the executive and in favour of Parliament and parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, you've seen this as well with some of the anti-terror stuff as well, where the uh, judiciary have acted against the executive, like the Belmarsh case, for example, um, in protecting citizens' civil rights. So in terms of relationships, it does appear that the Supreme Court uh, is more willing to challenge the executive and side with Parliament as a general kind of rule. And all of this fits into um, this question about, is the Supreme Court, is the judiciary too powerful in the UK? Have things gone too far? Are the judges standing up to the executive when they shouldn't be because they're not elected? Um, so, with that in mind, if you're humble, what I'd like to do is two things. There's a video I'd like to watch called the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. Um, you may remember, we actually watched about 20 minutes of this around Christmas time when we did about civil rights and civil liberties because uh, it talks about the Supreme Court standing up against the government protecting uh, citizens in the Belmarsh case. Uh, and about anti-terror legislation, etc, etc. What I'd like to do is watch the whole video, including that bit again, because there's no harm in watching that 20-minute uh, section as well. Uh, it was made when the Supreme Court, Court was first created, so, and it basically follows four judges. Lord Hope looks a bit like the character of the uh, Simpsons with the nuclear power station, Smithers is called, isn't he? Uh, Lord Kerr, he's the only one who's still on the Supreme Court. Lady Hale, who at the time was the only female Supreme Court judge, and then later on she became the president, and Lord Phillips, who was the president um, when it first set up. And it's quite nice because it shows how the judges make their decisions and decision-making. It's also quite nice because Lord Phillips says about how uh, the judges have to try and interpret what Parliament has said, and it talks about this relationship between the executive, the legislature, and uh, the Supreme Court. So there's a lot of questions on that. Um, I'm not sure what I've done with them. I'll have to dig them out again or rewrite re them out. But tomorrow I'll send you an email. I'll have the questions on so you to watch the video, answer the questions. Be thinking about all the way through. You know, what does this tell us about the relationship between the Supreme Court and the other branches? I'd also like to listen to a podcast on that site which I've mentioned. Uh, there's a really good one about is the Supreme Court too powerful? And they're debating uh, this particular issue. There's a number of cases mentioned, which again, any you don't have, make sure you jot down. I've made a table based off the um, the podcast, which will talk. Uh, and what, at the end, have a think about what does this tell us about the relationship between the court and the judicial, um, the court and the legislature, and the court and the executive. So if you get that done for about Thursday-ish, because I'll do the next video on Thursday. I shall basically hope they'll just wrap up the Supreme Court on Thursday and they can crack on with the EU. So that's for Thursday. If you get that done, that'd be great. Okay, see you later on.